Would you turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of John, chapter 1, and we shall begin in verse 29. Five glorious words in this incredible text. Uh, John says, Behold the Lamb of God. And I want us to look at this this morning. God has laid this on my heart for a day like this, an opportunity to study this incredible scripture this morning. In the Old Testament, the prophets prophesied about the Messiah coming. And God gave us great details about what the Messiah would be, where he would be from, the things that he would teach, the actions of his life, the way in which he would die, his resurrection. And sometimes people overlook the fact that John the Baptist had an incredible part to play in the ministry of Jesus. And the Old Testament prophets had talked about a man who would come, who would preach the truth, would preach repentance, would teach about the Messiah, in effect that this forerunner would come in and usher in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John begins his narrative of the life of Christ with that great passage, in the beginning was the Word, The Word was with God, the Word was God, and nothing was created without Him. He talks about Jesus coming unto His own, and His own not receiving Him, but those who did receive Him gave He them the power to become the children of God, or the sons of God. And then He takes up the narrative of John the Baptist, and His work, and what He did. And by the time we come to the text that we're in, Jesus had already been baptized by him, and John is being questioned about his ministry, about who he is. He's been asked, are you the Christ? Are you a prophet? And in the midst of that, he makes this incredible announcement. And the announcement came in the name of that he chose to call Jesus Christ. So would you stand with me once more as we read this text in John chapter 1, verse 29. If you have that in your Bibles, holler, howdy. All right, here we go, John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now remember, John the Baptist physically is six months older than Jesus. Not three months older than Jesus. And and he was before him on this life, but John says he was before me. Talking about his deity, talking about his being part of the Godhead. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen And I testify that this is God's chosen one. Father, be pleased to inhabit your word and your preaching today. May it touch the hearts of every one of us. And there's some here who have not yet committed themselves to the Lamb of God. And I would pray that this would be their day of salvation. Honor us with your presence throughout. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I want you to notice first the name that John gave him, the Lamb of God. Now, this was a beautiful word picture to Israel because everyone that heard John call Jesus the Lamb of God 
would understand exactly what John was saying as he called him the Lamb of God. I want you to notice some things that they would have seen. One of the things that they would have seen is innocence, just like a baby lamb. A a baby lamb who there with his mama or her mama and in every way dependent on them, in every way innocent without any kind of guilt, without any kind of guile. They would have seen Jesus and they would have known that Jesus stands out. No sin, no hatred, no lust, no pride, no ego, no will of his own, only a desire to do the will of God. How would you like to meet someone who fit that category? How would you like to meet someone that you could trust in every way? That when they spoke to you, you never had to wonder about their motives. When they spoke to you, you never had to wonder if it's truth or not. That when they took an action, when they fed the poor, when they helped the needy, you never had to worry about, is there an ulterior motive here? Just purity and innocence in every way. In a little bit, we're going to dedicate some children, dedicate some babies. And, and, and when you take those sweet, precious babies in your arms, many of you have had the pleasure of being a parent, and, and you've been able to, to see that miracle, and you've been able to look down And that precious little child of God in all of its innocence. (laughs) These two right here. Bax lived with Janice and I, his mom and dad did, from the time that he was about nine months old. And I got to hold him. I got to love on him. Little Elsie was born while they were living with us. In fact, Elsie was born not many days after I had my first neck surgery. And I was warned not to pick her up, and I I told the doctor, I I, I just can't see that happening. And he said, just sit in a chair, have somebody hand her to you. And I couldn't sleep. I couldn't lay in a bed. I was trying to sleep in a recliner, and her sweet mama would get up and feed her and then bring Elsie, and I could sit there and talk to her and hold her. It's so precious. Absolute purity, absolute innocence. Also, it's awfully sweet to have you guys here to worship with us. It is a very blessed thing for your grandma and grandpa. The fact that Jesus was completely innocent means that Jesus is qualified to be the Savior because God had to have a lamb without any spot or blemish. Had Jesus sinned, had he had a bad thought, had he had a bad motive, he would not qualify to be the Savior. And John points that out in the name, the Lamb of God. Another thing that they would have seen is meekness and patience. And that is exemplified in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one in all of history has ever been as misunderstood as Jesus was. He was mocked, he was despised, he was rejected by his own people, he was lied about, he was arrested, he was persecuted, all without ever paying back evil for evil, all done with meekness, all done with forgiveness, all done with patience. And he filled the prophecy of Isaiah when he said, like a sheep led to the slaughter. They would also have seen the lambs used in the daily sacrifice. It's seen over and over and over again as people came to the temple in Jerusalem and as they came there and gave those sacrifices to the priest, the priest would slay those sacrifices and the blood of the lambs and the goats and the bulls and the, tu- and the doves would cover their sin. They would have remembered that it was lambs there on the altar that purified them from their sin. These people knew the meaning as a sign of deliverance. They would have also, when he called him the Lamb of God, they would have also seen the Passover lamb. 
from the book of Exodus. And you remember that great story as God was delivering Israel from the bondage in Egypt how God sent nine plagues and every time Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he refused to let God's people leave. And then finally God sent the tenth plague, which was a death angel. And God told all of Israel, take a lamb without blemish or spot, slay that lamb, catch its blood, take a hyssop, which is a plant, and paint the sides, uh, the doorpost, and the lentils. And the lamb and the death angel will pass over you. And so they celebrated Passover. And here's what many people don't understand. During Passover, there in in Jerusalem, in the day of Jesus, all of Israel came. As many people as were, were healthy enough to make that pilgrimage would come to Jerusalem. And the priest would slay over 200 thousand lambs there in that seven-day period. Now listen, on the Temple Mount, there's a hill that runs down into the Kidron Valley, the Brook Kidron. It's usually a dry brook, but during Passover, the Brook Kidron runs fast, but not with water. It runs fast with the blood of the lambs of the sacrifice. Now watch. Jesus has the Last Supper, the Passover meal with his disciples. He walks down that that hill from the Kidron Valley or from the Temple Mount to the Kidron Valley. And the Lamb of God has to cross over the blood of the lambs. Crosses over to the Garden of Gethsemane. There he prays with his disciples. And he says to God, if there's a way for this to pass away from me, let it go. But it doesn't matter what I want. What you want is what's important. And he goes with the mob. He goes with the soldiers back across the blood of the lambs. And the next day, the blood of the lamb was shed. Why? Because he loved you. He loves you. Loves you. And he wants every one of us to have an eternal home with him in glory. And so Jesus came and he died. And when John painted this mind picture of the Lamb of God, they knew exactly what John was pointing them to. Listen very carefully. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, he he, he wasn't just using a cute name for Jesus that people might remember. He's saying, This is the divine Son of God. Co-equal, co-eternal. When he said, He was before me. He's talking about his eternal life, his eternal deity. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He is the consolation of Israel that we have looked for for so many years. The Lamb of God. Isn't that an incredible name? Isn't that an incredible picture of our Savior? The Passover Lamb who takes our sin away. Now, here's the difference, guys, between the blood of lambs and the blood of the lamb. The blood of lambs covered sin for a season. Didn't take them away. Didn't give you power and authority to resist temptation and to run from sin. It simply covered their sin. But the blood of the lamb When we come to know him, he literally takes our sin away from us. The sin debt is canceled. And we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You remember the lesson last week about temptation. We have the power within us because Jesus lives within us through the person of the Holy Spirit. We can resist temptation. We can resist evil. We do not have to sin because of the blood of the Lamb. Now, you know why we sin? 
We sin because we choose to sin. We sin because we want to sin. Because God has given to us the gift of his presence in our lives through the person of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead you away. A great verse that I missed in my, in my sermon last week. There is no sin that has overtaken us that along with the temptation, God gives us a way around it. Those people that tell you you have to sin are lying through their teeth. We sin because we want to. That's the name, the Lamb of God. Now, second, I want you to notice the mission. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, there are three things that I want you to understand about that statement. First, by his obedience and death, he took away the penalty of sin and the curse of sin from our lives. The whole world was and is guilty before God. Every man, woman, boy, and girl is a sinner. The book of Romans tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The book of Isaiah tells us there is no one righteous, no, not one. In fact, Isaiah tells us that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Now watch this. Jesus comes. Let me take you back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Let me take you back to this beautiful place. And you're able to go there today. And it is this beautiful garden. In fact, there are olive trees that are over 2,000 years old in this garden. It is the spot. You can go in there and you can kneel by one of these trees and you can be fairly certain that you are play, praying in a place where Jesus himself prayed. And remember that night and the agony. Because listen, the battle for Jesus wasn't on the cross. Because he fought that battle as he began his ministry as he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and he rejected all of those offers, throughout his ministry as he continued to move forward in spite of the works of Satan. And then in that garden of Gethsemane, Satan threw everything he had at Jesus. And the battle was won on his knees in prayer in the garden. Father, not what I will, but what you will. Guys, can I say something very blunt and very open? I hear stories that this church was founded in prayer and built by prayer. Right there. We have a quote from Isaiah. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And yet, I came to prayer meeting Wednesday, and I know there was a storm in the area, but I came here and there's less than a dozen people here to pray. And guys, I know you pray at home. I, I know all of that. But I believe in my heart that God wants this body on their knees in this altar. Asking God for direction. Asking God for hope. Asking God to lead us. Asking God to unify us. Asking God to work in us, every one of us. Why aren't you here? If you're working, I, I get that. You know, if I offered you $100 to go with me for a couple of hours on Wednesday evening and help me load something and get it to my house. Now, most of you would say, preacher, you don't have to pay me. I'll come and help you. But some of you would come. Stop whatever you're doing. We have an opportunity. God wants us to pray as a corporate body. God wants us to come and pray and be unified in prayer. Why don't you come? 
Just saying, guys. That's not part of this sermon, by the way. That's, that's just extra stuff. I'm here. I could assign that duty to somebody else, and I could go play golf on Wednesday night. You might fire me, but... Let me take you to a spot called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where the cross was, where Jesus died. And, and you remember those words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's that all about? Jesus, for all eternity past, perfect unity with the Father. Throughout his 33 years on the earth, he maintained that perfect unity. On the cross, as he is bearing the sin of the world, he died for every man, woman, boy and girl that had ever that that was have ever lived or will ever live are you listening it's an epic moment on the cross where god imputed all of everybody's sin onto jesus can you imagine the weight of that you know when you have disobeyed God willingly and God convicts you, you, you know the weight of that. If you love Jesus and you want to live for him, you know the weight of that. I have sinned. I don't want to carry that guilt. Can you imagine bearing the sin of everybody? And the Bible tells us that the Father... That God the Father cannot look upon sin. And so in that epic moment, there is for the only time of all eternity a separation between God the Father and God the Son. And he did that for you. If you would have been the only person in the world who would ever turn to Jesus, he would have died for you. And that death takes away the guilt of sin by God's justifying grace. How many of us here have something that we are ashamed of? Something in our past life that we would not want anybody to know? Jesus takes away the guilt and the shame. That doesn't make what you did right. It means by the grace of God, you have been completely forgiven and justified in the eyes of God. Do you know how God looks at you as a saved person? He looks at you through the blood of Jesus. He looks at you through eyes of grace. He looks at you with the righteousness of Christ because after he imputed our sin to Jesus, when we come to know Jesus, he imputes his righteousness to us. It's a glorious thing that God does. Let me give you one more thing here. I, I want you to notice the admonition. The admonition is behold. The, abs, ab, ab, the admonition is to look. And, and that word behold means to look, to understand. It, it, it means to gaze at it and, and to meditate on it and to think about it. What, what are we to do? We are to understand Jesus. Behold him in the mystery of his incarnation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about the birth story. 
the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, when John gives this narrative, John says, and the Word, Jesus, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Think about the incarnation. The God of all heaven, the God who created the universe that we see and universes that we can't discover. The glory of all of that came to live life just as we do. Behold him, the work that he did while he was here, the wonders of his life, the miracles, the healings, the loving. Behold him in that overwhelming agony of Gethsemane. Behold him on a cross as he dies for you. But by all means, by all means, behold him in his resurrection from the grave. We do not save, serve a dead Savior. We do not serve a fallen Savior. We serve a risen Savior, a living Savior, one who is able to save us, as the Bible says, to the uttermost. Now, guys, listen to me very carefully. Most of you I know know Jesus. You have had that once-in-a-lifetime experience, turning from your sin, turning to Jesus. And the instant, the instant you did that, Your sin was forgiven, the sin debt was canceled, and Jesus Christ came to live within you through the person of the Holy Spirit. Are you listening? You're God's child, and you will forever be God's child. You have a home in heaven for sure for all eternity because of the grace of the living God. But now... There's some here. And you've never had that definitive experience. You've never had that once in a lifetime experience of turning from your sin and turning to Jesus as Savior. Here's what that means for you. That means for you, if you die today, You don't go to heaven. You go to a place called Hades, a place of torment. And you remain there till the white throne judgment that you read about in the book of Revelation. When Jesus calls forth the dead. And they are judged according to their works. And works won't get you to heaven. And the Bible says that they are cast alive into the lake of fire and they are there forever and ever and ever. Wanting to die and not being able to. Wanting out of the misery and the misery never ending. There's no relief. There's no joy. There's no presence of God. I've had people tell me as I've shared Jesus with them, well, I won't be alone in hell. My friends will be there. It doesn't matter. You won't care. The agony of hellfire is such that all you can think about is the agony and the memory that I could have been saved. I I can't understand how you can hear this. It is the truth of the word of God and turn and walk out of here without committing your life to Jesus. Knowing the destination. I want you to, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes.
you've, you've heard those words. And you know that you know that you know that you need to come and be saved. You know that. And I've had people show hands. I've had people look up at me. And then at the end of the service, you don't make a move. I want you to be saved authentically today. I want you to leave here and know that you have a home in heaven. And I think the only way you'll really know that is if you come down to this altar and you let one of us help you ask Jesus to be your Savior. So we stand. We begin to sing. I want you to do that today. Don't wait. Stand with me, would you please? As Carrie leads us, you come right here, right now. I'm waiting on you right now. I want to help you. Come on.
separated from his wife for all eternity. And so he came and gave his heart to Jesus. And you can do that right now. Remember that great old song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? No need for it to be broken. You can go to heaven with your family. Give us a little more singing, would you, Miss Carrie? You come right now. We're waiting on you. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, He is all that I need. Would you come up here with me? Miss Sandy, you're already coming. Sandy will be on this mic. So you all with babies and children, come on up. Come right out here in the middle. Here we come. Here we come. Yes. The purpose of baby dedication is to establish the partnership between the parents and the church in passing on the faith to their children. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. We have Shane and Hillary Silvis. These two are going to be baptized shortly. Uh, and we have Miss Aubrey and baby Tori, and she is growing well too fast. And then we have Rachel and Steve, Ross, and Charlotte. Hi, baby. And then we have Brian and Jessica Byers, and they're dedicating Owen today, and he's my buddy. I want to give a charge to the dads. And, and guys, if, if you agree to this charge at the end, I just want you to say we do, say it right out loud. But I want to charge you to love God with all your heart to put him first in your life, to authentically have a Christian home. I, I want you to teach your children to do the same thing. I want you men to love your wives and honor them the way the Bible says to. To love them as Christ loved the church. And one of the ways that we teach our children, one of the ways that we teach our little girls what kind of husband to look for is by the way we treat their mamas. One of the ways that we teach our young men how they're to treat their wives is by the way you treat their mama. And they won't fall far from that. As the head of your household and coming forward between God or before God and his people, do you gentlemen dedicate your lives to your wife your family, and to the Lord. Miss Sandy.
Parents, by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your children to the Lord? If so, say we do. Do you confess your faith and commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? We do. <laughs> do, you at, do you acknowledge that your child is a gift and a trust from God and that you are responsible to God for their Christian nurture? Will you pray for your child's salvation and teach your child the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? Since your child will learn by both your word and example, will you set a godly example in prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, giving, and serving others in your church home? Do you at this time present your child before God, saying that whatever God might want your child to be or to do, you are willing to release them to his perfect plan? And I want to give a charge to this good church family. Um, parents have first responsibility in raising their children. That goes without exception. Mom and dad will be the models for their children. But in the society in which we live, they need much help. And the greatest source of help is a local Bible-believing New Testament church. And I ask this church family to commit to these people that stand before you to model God's love to these children and these families. I pray that you will commit yourself to never putting a stumbling block before God's precious children. I, I ask you to commit yourselves to be used by God to help train and, and lead these children to Jesus. And if you as the church body agree to make that commitment, give us a hearty we do. We do. And these folks will be praying for you. And I want to pray for you and your children not now. And then we have some gifts we want to give you. Um, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the miracle of birth and new life. And the precious nature of our relationship with our children. Help these men and ladies follow your leadership in their lives and help their children come to know you. And, and, and along with that, to help them have joyful, peaceful childhoods that enable them to grow into adulthood in a manner that's pleasing to you. Help this church honor her commitment to praying, and helping, and leading. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Miss Kathy? Oh, you're Sandy. I'm sorry. We are going to give each one of these mothers a rose. And this is something that I have done for years. And ladies, I, I want to tell you something about this, Rose. Your child's life is like a blooming rose. And life has a way of coming in and pulling petals off and throwing them down. Life has a way of crushing your child. And there is no safer place for a child, no better place than in their mama's arms. And you should be a safe place for your children at any time and every time. We're going to give to the dads a book. And that book is about shepherding your child as a man of God, how you do that. And then, guys, we have a gift for your children. And it is the Word of God. Now, we're giving this to Dad right now. I think I got the names on all of them on the top. This will be Owie. And we're giving this to Dads because you are the steward of the Word of God for your child's life. And you make sure that Word gets in them. And then for your child to remember this day, we have a very special gift for them. It is a lamb. Little stuffed lamb. 
And it should be their first memory of you teaching them about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.